I'd like to call Jeff and Mike up here. Uh, uh, to get started, though, I'd like to uh, have Jeff come up here and talk a little bit about uh, how we put this together because really Mike and I were the beneficiaries of the hard work that Jeff uh, put together of organizing this whole trip. So, Jeff, you want to give us kind of the, how this thing came together? Okay, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jeff Crone, and I am uh, the owner and operator of a company called Northern Thumb Crop Consulting, and we're based out of uh, Elkton, Michigan. We cover approximately 250,000 acres in the eastern half of Michigan, and we don't sell a single thing. We don't sell seed, fertilizer, chemicals, or anything. All we sell is services. Uh, we work for the grower, and our main goal is to make the farmer more profitable. Um, I'm also the uh, manager of our family farm. It's a 2,000 acre cash crop farm, also near, near Elkton. Our crop rotation is corn, wheat, and dry beans. So Dennis wanted me to give a little background of how this trip to Germany came about. So uh, let's back up about five years on our farm. We're always trying to do some research on our farm to benefit ourselves and also to convey that information to our growers or the growers that I work with. And so we started, kind of took an interest in wheat production. How can we get better wheat production? So what we did is we played around uh, for two years with some cross seeding of some wheat. So about five years ago, our normal seeding rate was around about two million seeds per acre. So what we did is we took a couple fields and we split them and we cross seeded them. So basically, Half the field, we, we planted a million seeds in one direction, you got done, we planted a million seeds in the other direction. The other half the field, we planted two million seeds in the, in the same direction, seven and a half inch row, uh, grain drill from John Deere. And basically what we're trying to do is get better coverage or better utilization of sunlight, we thought, um, with, our, with our drill. Kind of the same concept is uh, maybe thinking narrower rows like with sugar beets or dry beans that we've done in our area we found some pretty significant bump in yield by going narrow rows. So kind of took that theory into, into wheat production. So we cross seeded and uh, we did this for two years and we got uh, an average of about 10 to 11% bump in yield. And we did everything exactly the same across both sides of the field. Fertilizer, seed, chemicals, everything was the same. The only thing that was different was it was cross seeded. So hey, we thought we kind of onto something here with this cross seeding. So what we did is uh, uh, start looking for a drill because obviously we don't want to cross seed 500 acres of wheat. That's going to waste a lot of time. So done some research and found that a company called Amazon, which is based in Germany, they make a narrow row grain drill or seed drill. And it's a 12 centimeter drill, which converts to about 4.8 inches, 4.8 inch rows. This is over in Germany. So started doing some more research and I actually found a drill down in Illinois. And I, I think there's maybe less than 10 of these drills in the United States, but I found a, a four meter drill, which is about 12 foot wide, uh, down in Illinois. Uh, AMS Incorporated was the name of the company. And went and looked at the drill, made the deal with the guy, Jack Knoop is the contact guy, and he brought the drill up to us. So uh, the following two seasons then we we did comparisons with the seven and a half inch row John Deere drill versus our 4.8 inch row drill. Seeding rates the same, we were still around two million seeds and everything else the same, fertilizer, seed, chemicals. And our lowest bump and yield was 8%, our highest bump and yield was 15%. So um, definitely was the direction we wanted to go. So got rid of the John Deere drill and we plant all our wheat now with this narrow row drill and we're even doing some custom planting with alfalfa with it too. Uh, a couple of the Dutch dairies in our area are familiar with the Amazon drill, the narrow rows, and um, wanted us to plant, so we did. Now I don't have any yield data for uh, advantage in alfalfa, um, but we are doing some custom work with that. So that's the Amazon side of it. In the meantime, uh, one of my larger uh, consulting clients, uh, Peters Brothers Farms from Memphis, Michigan. They farm about 15,000 acres. They are a dealer for Horsch Equipment, which is also a German company. And every year they have a field day. Uh, Joker is their real popular piece of uh, vertical tillage. But every year they have a field day that they demonstrate their equipment. And two years ago, Michael Horsch, who was the CEO of uh, Horsch Company, he was there and got talking with him. And um, he was talking or telling us about a wheat seed singulator drill. Basically, they have a design now 
that they build a drill, they brought it to market, that takes wheat seed and singulates it approximately an inch and a half apart, which the gears start turning, hey, this, this might be onto something here. Maximizing tillers, saving on seed cost. So I said, well, how can we get one of these drills here in Michigan? Can we buy one? Can you give us one or let us use one? So he says, nope, you gotta come to Germany and go through our agronomy program first. So that sparked our, our trip to Germany. Um, so I got these two guys to go with us, or to, 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 go, you know, to go over to Germany. Last a year ago, last winter, I met with both companies, or I guess I had contact with both companies to get our trip all lined up. And then last July, the three of us went over there for seven days to Germany. Um, we took out five of the, I guess, the most important things to talk about for you guys today, and we're going to kind of split it up amongst the three of us. So the top five bullet points are climate, we're going to, Dennis is going to talk about, seeding, we're going to turn it over to Mike, then I'm going to cover nutrient application, uh, back to Mike for plant health, and then I'm going to finish up with, with tillering. It's all about the tillers. So I just want to tell everybody that what the stuff that we're going to tell you are not recommendations. This is my disclaimer, our disclaimer. These are only observations that we saw over in Germany. So hopefully you guys can pick something out and try it on your farm. We're definitely going to try some future plots with these uh, things that we've learned over there because they're getting much better yields than us. Now there's some other factors that we can't control, but um, hopefully you guys can pick something out and try it on your farm so we can, uh, we can get better wheat yields here in Michigan. So we'll turn it over to Dennis. He's going to start with uh, where we traveled here over in Germany. All right, well, thank you. Uh, first off, uh, let me just give you set, kind of come, some context to this whole thing. Uh, this field of wheat that you see in the background on this slide, uh, Dr. George Schoenbacher uh, from Agrar University took us out there, and his estimate at the time we were visiting that field was about 12 tons per hectare. And so I, I, I learned quickly that you've got to have your Google unit calculator on your phone in order to convert everything from metric back to English. That's about 175 bushel yield uh, per acre. So they have some pretty phenomenal yields that they're able to achieve um, in, in Germany. So um, like uh, Jeff said, we're going to talk about a few things. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of setting the stage for where we were and what we visited. Um, you see the line on that slide? And you see where it is in Germany? We were north of that line. Now follow that line over to, to the U.S. Where does that line come in the U.S.? The UP. It's north of the UP. So in terms of latitude, we were quite a bit further north. So you might say, oh, well, because of their climate and whatnot, they can grow 175 bushel of wheat, and we can. But let's let's dig a little bit more into the climate and what do they really have. Okay, this is a chart showing the uh, average annual precipitation uh, in different cities in Germany. Uh, this chart shows the average annual temperatures, and then um, the third one is Lansing. So let's do some comparisons. Uh, so if you look at the average high temperature in Lansing, it's 57.3 degrees is our average annual high, okay? Now let's compare that to the average annual high in um, Germany, and uh, in Berlin it's 56, uh, Bremen 56, Hamburg 55, so average annual high temperature, not that much different. Average annual low temperature in Michigan is 39.1. Over there, what do you notice about their average low temperatures? Two or three degrees Celsius, or uh, Fahrenheit warmer, isn't it, okay? So a little bit of difference there. Um, average high temperature is really not much different. The average low temperature is a little bit warmer there. And then if you look at the precipitation, uh, in Lansing, the average is 31 inches, 31.73 inches over there. Uh, notice they have quite a range. They have a dry area where they can't get the 175 bushel yield um, uh, of wheat as well. So these are, this is like a map of where we went uh, in Germany, so we were kind of all over the place. We did uh, make a trip over into Czech Republic. Uh, we visited one of the corporate farms that uh, uh, the Horsch brothers own, uh, one of two or three that they own, and uh, it's about 15,000 acres that they have there, and we got to see. Actually, it was really interesting because all the prototype stuff that they try to manufacture at Horsch goes to live there. So we got to see all of the prototype equipment that they actually are still using on that farm. Uh, very interesting. Um, soils. Uh, whenever I've talked about this, well, how, what's different about Germany that, from here? Um, what are their soils? What's their climate? And so on. Soils, they manage variable soils just like we do. 
You walk out in the field and there's usually two, three, four, five, six so different soil types within a field that they're trying to manage. They have sand, silt, and clay just like we do. Um, and so they're trying to manage the variability just like we do uh, as well. Uh, I tried to take the soil series and convert it from German uh, to English and after spending about two hours I gave up so I just put up a pretty map and said look there's variability in their soils. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing to consider uh, that's different between Germany and here is daylight hours. Um, the first line there shows Berlin in October so this is fall. Okay, so fall after like planting time, uh, average sunrise 7:30 a.m., average sunset 6:15. That gives them a day length of 10 hours and 45 minutes. Compare that to Lansing in October uh, is 11 hours and 15 minutes. So in October we have a little bit longer day than what they do there. Now look at Berlin in June. Uh, sunrise is at 4:45 a.m. Doesn't set till 9:30. That gives them a 16 hour and 45 minute day. Uh, compare that to here, and we are a 15 hours and 15 minute day. So they have a little bit longer day for grain fill period um, compared to what we do. So that extra day length helps them with a the grain fill period. So, you know, Peter was talking about can we get one more seed per head um, or, or one more uh, gram in the, in the test weight? Well, they've got another hour of sunlight every day to help accumulate um, uh, yield. So uh, that just kind of sets the stage to compare where we were in Germany and what. Uh, compared to here, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Yeah, um, I guess the, the biggest thing I want to start with when we talk about uh, seeding is their crop rotation over there. Uh, a very common crop rotation is uh, wheat, wheat, and canola. So it's a lot different from here, and they're dealing with uh, a lot of the disease issues and that kind of thing. And uh, I know Peter sitting here looking at me won't like this, but they like tillage, and they like a lot of it. Uh, so uh, to manage that residue, even in a lower moisture environment, they start with wheat stubble, they're going wheat to wheat. They, uh, they'll hit it with something like a joker or high speed disc and incorporate it, and then they'll wait for another rain, and then they will incorporate it. And what they're looking for is an even distribution of residue throughout the top six to eight inches. And then they'll hit it with a chisel plow, <coughs> and then they will plant with, a, uh, with their seeder you want to switch to the European style? Yep. Yeah. So um, you can kind of see they have more or less like a high speed disc uh, mounted to the front of their sear. So they are working directly in front of the, uh, of the drill units. As far as seeding rates, um, low, very low. Um, they're down four, four to um, 400 to a million, I think, as Dennis did the did the conversions, uh, and uh, a lot of things we do the same is uh, one inch depth, that's what they're shooting for, or two to three centimeters. Um, fertilizers incorporated with the disc, and right in front and right down with the seed. So they're trying to uh, they're trying to get the seeds as even and uniform seed depth as possible. Uh, studies have shown that the, uh, the emergence of wheat follows the same trend line as corn. So uh, if one plant comes up one day later, you're looking at somewhere to a 25 to 30% less, less yield on that plant. And that's where the whole um, singulation and uh, uniform seed depth has come from. So it's kind of like corn. If that plant that comes up less or more than 48 hours less than the other one, it's going to yield less. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's pretty well proven that later emerging plants are less yielding. I don't know if there's any field studies like corn. Obviously, it's a little bit harder to do with wheat than it is with corn. But there's green there's a greenhouse study that shows uh, it follows right along that same trend line. If if you want to go out and count a million and a half or two million seeds per acre and, and count individual plants. I'd, I'd love to have your help. That's what we got you for, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you need help, call me. I'm coming. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'll, I'll make sure I get your number before I leave. All right. We need to start growing better weed around here if we're going to survive. Except in volunteers. <laughs> uh, you want to show the singular? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You just tell me which one you want. Uh, right there. Yeah. So uh, this is what horses come up with a simulator. It, uh, yeah. 
green button. All right. Yeah, so basically it looked like the internal uh, part of a water pump, basically the meter transfer pump, but this spins and is driven by an electric motor and catches it from the distributor. Um, but uh, So it comes out of the distributor head, gets caught here, and this singulates it and correlates with ground speed and singulates the seed as it's coming out. One thing we noticed was that it takes a very, very uniform seed size for it to be accurate. So it would, be, it would have to be a lot more, um, a lot more intensively milled or screened out if we were going to do something like that here. Yeah, this is a picture of uh, an Amazon seeder. You can see the, uh, the tillage disc here right in front and then the, uh, the packing wheels. <coughs> that was another thing. Uh, tillage was important to them and they were also focused on uh, compress re reconsolidating the soil as they put it. They did not like any extra pore space or anything extra overly loosened up. Picture of a wheat field. And uh, back to Jeff. I got another question for you there. Do you think that because they're growing wheat on wheat and doing some deep tillage before they plant their fall wheat, that they're breaking up any compaction that could be causing, you know, roots not to penetrate? Versus like what we do, I mean, we don't, we just go out there and till it or no-till it and we've had all the spring and summer rains and, and sprayer traffic and all that and that's compacting our soil that maybe these roots don't grow as much as that they could possibly? Right, so the question was, for anybody that didn't hear, um, did I think that the extra tillage or the extra deep tillage is an advantage or helped with the root growth in the, in the next crop? Is that fair? Um, yeah, I, th I think it's definitely a possibility. I think um, that's what we've thought to start with the trials. I mean, uh, the only way we can learn over here is try it for ourselves. So, anything else? Oh, we've got a question right here. Oh. Over there, uh, they have issues with, the question. okay, repeat the question, uh, how's their vomitoxin over in Germany? And they also have issues with that also over there. Now their, the rainfall is less and we know that that correlates with uh, rainfall during flowering period. So it's not maybe as a big issue over there, but they do have vomitoxin over in Germany also. Are they? Are their genes coming here, or are our genes going there? Both. Seriously. Yeah, I, I thanks for, I, I don't know the answer to that. Oh, it's, the answer is both. They're, it's going both ways. Yep. <laughs> um, back to the vomitoxin issue, uh, they make 11 applications uh, between fungicides, nutrients, and whatnot across their wheat. You talk about intensive management, uh, they intensively manage more than anybody I've ever seen. Uh, so. Yeah, they have issues, and that's why they're, they have to make so many applications. But when you grow any crop back to back, you're going to increase your pressure for insects and diseases and, and uh, so on. So what are they doing? Is it, is it, I assume, all winter wheat, and then is it all red or white, or what are they doing? Did, I, did you get a flavor for red or white? Did, did I don't remember. I it's don't remember. All, it's mostly all red. Okay, I, it's mostly all red. Um, it is all winter wheat. Uh, I don't think we saw any spring wheat at all uh, when we were over there. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we're going to move next to uh, nutrient application. And this picture here is a picture of a, of a horse spreader and developed by Han. And it was on the research farm in the Czech Republic that we went to and virtually all of their fertilizer application is dry fertilizer. Uh, liquid is expensive over there and it's uh, very hard to get, so they're doing multiple applications of dry fertilizer. Um, P and K is applied in the fall as a starter, a little bit of nitrogen, and always following soil tests for how much P and K that they want to apply. Um, one thing in Germany, they're very, very environmentally cautious. Um, It'd be like trying to farm in California. They're extremely environmentally 
cautious over there. So very little, if any, nitrogen applied in the fall and setbacks from ditches, a lot of filter strips. They're very mentally environmentally, environmentally cautious. Um, so dry fertilizer in the fall, P and K. Then uh, they do much foliar feeding also throughout uh, the season and that's mostly the micronutrients. Um, one thing we did pick up on, and this was from Dr. George Schornberger from uh, Guar University, Northern Guar in Schockenthal, Germany, that um, he talked about boron. Now this is not a recommendation to spread boron and everything, but he said, he told us this, this guy consults, he's got like 15 consultants underneath of him, they cover like a million acres, and boron once, nothing. Boron twice, nothing. Boron three times, seven bushels, just like that. So is that something that we should be doing here? We're definitely going to be doing some plots to, to try to quantify that, to see if that's gonna work here in Michigan. Um, now nitrogen application, again, is done with dry fertilizer. And it's pretty similar to what we're doing. You know, an early application based on tiller size, and then a secondary application. But a lot of them are doing also a third application of, of a dry urea or like form at, at heading time or not quite at heading time, let's say at flag leaf time. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to bump protein. They've proven that they can bump protein by putting a late application of nitrogen on. Now obviously we don't get a premium for protein like they do, so we try to keep our nitrogen applications a little bit earlier. Their second application in the season, the first application is around the first, when it starts to green up, second application is maybe a little bit later than what we've been doing, around the second node stage. That can shorten it up a little bit, puts more of the, of the nitrogen into the head to make a better head. Um, yeah, paid premium, talked about that. What they're trying to do is, you wanna to move to the next slide there. This is a picture of an Amazon spreader, and they have spreaders that are very, very high technical spreaders. You know, they can spread nitrogen 150, 160 feet wide at a time, and we actually have one of these spreaders on our farm. Do variable rate, it, it spreads multiple widths. You can program what width that you want to spread, but, but uh, their spreaders over there aren't just the local you know, $10,000 spreader that you rent from the elevator. Um, you know, these are 20, 30, 40, $50,000 spreaders, but they're an amazing tool for what they can do. I'm gonna switch to the next one. Um, this is a, just a pull type sprayer is, is a lot what they use over there. Not many big custom rigs, but a lot of pull type sprayers that also highly technical sprayers. Um, this is obviously what they would use for their, for their foliar feeding. And this is, this is like my dream field. We were actually in this field, and this field is projected to go over 200 bushels per acre. But what they're trying to do is, what we've all alluded to, is they're trying to grow an even crop from start to finish. And look how even that canopy is out there. They want a completely even canopy, and that all starts with the seed placement, the applications of, uh, of all of their, their fertilizers and, and growth regulators, and that's, that's what we want to try to get to, is that perfect scenario right there. That's the perfect field. So, it, it looks like a little bit of nitrogen burn, possibly, because they're doing a lot of foliar feeding. Yeah, it, may, it may actually be the reaction to uh strike rust so there's a reaction to strike rust that's genetic that does that and so it, they have strike rust issues as well so it could be that genetic reaction to strike rust. It could be a genetic reaction to, to strike rust. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it doesn't get the strike rust but it gets that leaf tip necrosis. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. We, we get it here as well. By mm -hmm. the okay. Okay we'll move on to the next one. Okay. That's my last one. Well, uh, the next step is plant health, and that's uh, as Jeff alluded to. I think the uh, the key point is scouting, scouting, scouting. Uh, if you got 11 applications or 9 to 11 applications, do they were all uh, critically timed, and they're all timed based on what the field conditions were like. Uh, one of the huge differences they have over there between what we do is their use of plant growth regulators. They're old hat there. They've been using them for 30 years. They're very cheap and they know exactly what each one of them is doing and they know when to use them based on sunlight conditions and different growing conditions. 
So uh, they will use one in the fall, so they can push that planting date earlier. They will they will use one if it, before it gets too growthy. They use one in the spring, and their goal to use that growth regulator in the spring is to knock off the dominance of the first main tiller, and then they're trying to make it an even competition between the top three, four, five tillers, and make them all even, so more yield across the four or five than having one main tiller, and the next one's kind of sapping off of that. Uh, one question about all the delivered applications of the fungicides and growth regulators. Is there a consuming public over there? I think it's very well resolute. I mean, God, if we tried this in Michigan, I think uh, our, our consumers would say, God, we're not going to eat, eat that grain and sell a chemical factory there. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the uh, question was the chemical factor or something like that. I mean, I, I think the important thing is, number one, I think we're already facing that. I mean, um, but. Uh, Are they? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But uh, I think they justify every one of their applications, and they justify their nutrient applications. Um, I don't know what else we can do. The other thing that they're doing is they're, they're doing reduced rates of most of these products, but they're hitting it more often, which spreads your risk as well. But they are very much, as Jeff said, uh, in fact, that the one uh, research farm we went and visited in Czech Republic, they, he, they have, they're designing a completely closed system for mixing and loading pesticides where there is never a drop that can touch the ground and they can document and track every ounce of water, every ounce of product that gets into the system and gets out into the field. So uh, it's a very big deal for them there, yes. Yeah, but you said, you know, you said earlier that they're very environmentally conscious and yet, boy, they're pouring a crap to it. I mean, it's, I mean, that sounds almost kind of like you're talking about a little thing. Wow. No. I think the total rates might be. The, the, the total rates are still maybe what we're doing, oh. but they're just feeding it as needed. So they're putting on the same thing only a lot more often. They're, they're driving, they like driving across the field. <laughs> Question over here. Just in response to his comment, we've been involved in the sustainability, Kellogg's and Sagenis sustainability project in the last three or four years, whatever it's been. In, we do a lot of fungicides and higher nitrogen rates too, and we get a, a report card at the end that compares our results to the rest of the state of Michigan. And per yield, we get higher yields for, and the people that are in the project, not just ourselves, our, our carbon footprint and our yield per, for nitrogen and for dollars spent is lower, or I mean our yields higher for the amount of fertilizer and carbon footprint than the average is. So I mean, just because you're putting more product out doesn't mean you're, you're using more chemicals to break or dumping more poison out the ground. Right, yeah, I mean the basic response was and we're in the same sustainability program that, you know, it's very critical to focus on, number one, return on investment and the plant health, you know, if you're getting a return and yield for your investment and for the chemical usage, it's justified and it's more uh, sustainable overall. Yeah. Well, that's just a picture of the sprayer. I think Jeff showed that. Um, and there's a set of their nozzle selection there. Um, they're very, uh, very key on focusing on their pressure and uh, proper calibration of their sprayer and what kind of tips and rates and things they were using for each different product. Yes. One thing about this, uh, if you look in the center here, that thing right there emits a uh, light. It's like a pulsating light. Uh, so this thing right in the center right, right here. Uh, they do a lot of spraying at night. Um, they pay attention to humidity and if it gets too dry, uh, they will, uh, they'll, they'll quit spraying and uh, they'll do a lot of spraying at night as a result. So what that, that pulsating light does is allow them to see their spray pattern in the dark. So uh, they are loading up their equipment with more technology than what we ever thought of. You mentioned the, the fertilizer spreader. They, they've got radar, seven radar sensors on there. They can, they can detect and map the spread pattern behind that, that spreader. 
Um, it's, what they can do with a, a spitter spreader is, is, is amazing. And they're, they're adding all this technology as well on, on their sprayers, trying to do a better job of that they're applying. And this is just a picture of some of the plots that we saw there. I think this one was a variety plot that they were working towards. 150. And, uh, okay. Next one. And I just threw this picture in here to show that they don't have everything figured out yet. So they, uh, <laughs> they're still working with things too. So. I don't know. I don't know Managing tillers. Yeah. Okay, last one here. Managing tillers. It's all about the tillers. Everything has to do with the tillers. So this is a good picture that Dennis put up here and basically it's it's showing how to count tillers. Um, there are basically it's been determined there's five main or primary tillers on your wheat plant and that's what you want. If you get more than five, well let me back up, the five tillers all put out their own root system and they feed off their root system. Once you get past five then it starts to put off more tillers or auxiliary tillers, secondary tillers that pull nutrients away because they do not put out their own root system. They pull nutrients away from the main tillers. So what they're trying to do and focus on in Germany is to get about four to five tillers and to maximize their yields. You know, when you were, we're harvesting wheat and you see them little heads down underneath the canopy, you think, oh, that's my extra yield. That's terrible. We don't want that. We want everything to grow evenly, just like we talked about with the corn, grow up evenly. Um, how Horsch is, is managing their tillers or the direction that they're going with is this singulator drill to place the seeds approximately an inch and a half apart and then manage their tillers that way. Uh, there's other ways that they're doing it also. Mike had talked about the growth regulators. They have a couple more growth regulators that are, are labeled there that we don't have labeled here in the United States to help manage tillers. Um, how we can try to do that is with our nitrogen application. Uh, some of the wheat that's planted in the fall, planted early, it tillers in the fall. So we don't, you don't want a lot of nitrogen on early planted wheat in the fall. If, if your wheat is planted late in the fall and you just barely comes out of the ground, that's the wheat you want to target your, your first nitrogen to in the springtime to get it to tiller, to put out more tillers. And, and, uh, wheat that's tillered in the fall, you want to delay the nitrogen application in the springtime because it's already tillered out. You're going to put a big shot of nitrogen on five tillers, it's going to tiller more and we don't want that. It's going to pull the nutrients away from them main, main stems in there. Go ahead. This is just a, a, a picture of an Amazon drill. We have a drill exactly like this on our farm. This is the 4.8 inch row drill. Okay. They're trying to singulate the seed and and put it, you know, exactly an inch and a half apart. They've determined that once it gets a seed gets more than two inches apart, it cannot compensate for that wider gap. Because you've you've all seen, uh, let's say, in a drowned out spot in the field or on the headland, you see one wheat plant growing up, and it's got like 15 heads on it, 15 tillers on it, on there. Well, that's you know, it's okay for that spot, but it's it doesn't make your optimum yield across the field. Go ahead. Uh, Mike alluded to this. They do a lot of tillage. They love tillage. This has a vertical disc system in front of the grain drill. You can see the seed hopper on top and the vertical tillage, tillage system basically is working up the ground one more time behind the tractor to, uh, to get a great seed bed when they plant, plant the, the wheat over there. And they're big believers, believers in firmers. Every piece of equipment that they have, if it's a drill, if it's a tillage tool, has some type of firmer on it. Not necessarily a packer, but a firmer. They like to have a firm seed bed for all the applications that they're doing over there as far as drilling and, and uh, working up the soil. Do they have a firmer right in the trench where the seed is going? So it's kind of like a heat firmer or something similar? Uh, a lot of them are rolling firmers, a rolling firmer. Rolling firmer. Yeah. Um, it is a referral. Right down yep. Track. Yep. It's. Uh, I don't think we got a good picture of that. Why don't you flip one more and see what we got? No, so this is a so sprayer. Good seed to soil contact. Correct. Correct. They're making a nice firm trench to drop the seed in, so they get good seed to soil contact. John. Uh, yes. Uh, you said that they delayed the hard or the application of nitrogen. You know, well tillered fall wheat. How would that compare to what? 
What time of year would we be putting our spring application on that? If, it's really well till it's fall week. Yeah, but so the question was is when do we put on or when should we put on our nitrogen in the springtime for well tillered wheat? And what they're doing is with dry fertilizer again, is they're putting on a very little amount at green up. So they're going out counting tillers and well established wheat that's got more than five tillers, first time uh, first pass in the spring they're putting on a very low amount, maybe 20, 30 pounds an end, and that's it. But fields, so they can get everything covered at the same time, fields that have uh, very little growth, at that same time they'll put 60 pounds of nitrogen on out there to get it to tiller more in the springtime. And then their second application will be around almost to the second node stage, which is later than we've been normally doing it, to put on a big shot of nitrogen, you know, another 50, 60 pounds, or maybe, maybe more than that, because some of them are up to 200 pounds of nitrogen. And then they're doing that third application to promote uh, more protein. So does that kind of help answer the question a little bit? Okay. May 10th. If you want a date, it's, it would be land saying it would be May 10th-ish. Yeah, May 10th. Peter says May 10th. Ish. 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 Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Every year is different, right? Sure, sure. Yep. That's all I have to say. It was ish. So uh, as far as uh, tillers, like I said, uh, we think with our narrow drill, our Amazon drill, um, we, we've greatly reduced our seeding rate. We, we used to put on 2 million seeds. Our trials we done last year, 1.2 million seeds was our best yield out there. And that was the lowest that I went with our drill. So I, we're going to do a trial again next year and, and even go lower than that and see if we can still maintain our yields by dropping our seeding rate down because we're planting it in narrower rows. Um, the theory is possibly is we're better utilizing our sunlight. We don't get as many daylight hours here as they do in Germany, so what better way to, to you better utilize our sunlight is than to plant a little bit narrower. Some guys say, well, let's broadcast our seed out there, but it's just you can't get it even. You get some seeds on the ground, you get some seeds an inch deep, two, three, four inches deep. You know, you get better coverage of your soil, but it's just too uneven. It's too uneven out there. So. Question. Oh, yes, way back there. You know your size What's the size of your average fields? Um, not very big. Depends on Eastern. It, yeah, it depends where you're at. There are some big farms. Uh, it was really interesting. We could tell when we crossed where the, the wall was for east to west Germany. The, the eastern side, let me get this right now, had the bigger farms because the government took it over many years ago clean out the fence rows and some people work for the for the government basically on their own land which kind of was not a very good thing but uh, the, that area had bigger equipment than once you got in western Germany was the old smaller farms a lot smaller equipment but you could we could tell right when we crossed it every time we crossed the, the old wall line yes Did you guys get to see any side-by-side -side comparisons between the Amazon and then also the horse six-inch planter with the simulation did you see any difference in uh, yield? Did they see any difference in yield? We didn't see any, and uh, as far as I remember, they're, they're doing research on the farm, this, this Northern Guard University, um, versus the singulation, which I should say that the, the, the horse drill was a 15 centimeter drill, which is about 8 inches. The singulator drill. We had 6 inches up there. Six. Six. Was it 6 six inches? 4.8. 4. 4. 4.8 is the Amazon. Yes, yes but. Uh, the horse is six? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, the horse is, is six. And uh, we didn't physically see what the yield difference was, but their horse is going in the direction of the singulator drill, is what they're doing. In Amazon, we, we talked to the guy who was in charge of development of the singulation component of their, their drill, and it sounded to me like they weren't completely convinced that seed singulation is the direction that they want to go. So they, Amazon doesn't currently have a drill on the market that will singulate seed. Um, right now, I think Horse is the only yes. one. Yep. Um, and then we're trying to, you know, you saw the picture of the Monosum unit here a few slides ago. We're trying to singulate seed with that um, here. And I've got some research trials that we're, we're looking at different populations. but. Um, you know, Jeff mentioned that managing tillers is something that they're really they're focusing on, um, and it kind of gets back to that yield component, like what Peter said this morning. Um, their target is they want 600 heads per meter square. How are you going to get 600 heads in a meter square? Are you going to plant 600 seeds? Are you going to plant 200 seeds and hope for um, three heads per plant? You know, how are you going to do that? So, 
you know, some people tend to, well, I'm just going to dump a whole bunch of extra seed out there to try to get that population. Um, and others are like, no, let's manage the tillers um, and try to promote as much tillering as possible. And in Germany, they've taken that almost to the other extreme where, you know, they're only planting 400,000 seeds per acre. That's where they start in, in the fall. So if, when they're planting in September, just like we do, um, when they plant in September, their target is 400,000 seeds per acre. Okay, so if they're going to hit um, their target, um, they're planning on three to four heads per plant. Okay, so that, that's, that's what they're trying to manage for. That's why they're doing some of these plant growth regulators, the micronutrients, the, the multiple trips across there. Um, you know, we talk about high management, and we've tried to do some high management here um, at MSU, and our high management starts in the spring. We forgot about everything that happened in the fall and getting the crop planted and started and up. And uh, they, they are managing the crop. They manage wheat like we manage corn here. Yes. Okay. Everybody here manages corn. That's primary crop. That's the number one. That's the money maker. That's what pays the bills. Okay. Over there is wheat. Yeah. Over, the, over there, wheat is not the runt pig. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's, it's not the runt pig. I would say maybe canola or uh, maybe canola. potatoes is, is the runt pig over there. Question. So what, what do they get a bushel? I'm sorry? What? Price, price per bushel. Oh, price per bushel. We didn't talk much about economics. I don't know what what they're getting paid. It, it'd be in euros, I would be my guess, is what they get paid. But I... Right. So, I so they, they used to get about $800 a ton. They're backed off now to about five or $550 per ton. How does that convert to bushels? Price per bushel, any idea? Yeah, 550 a bushel divided by 36. I don't know what's that work out to. Quite a bit more than what the guys here are getting paid. Okay. And obviously it's profitable. So hard, right? So hard, three quarters a mile over an hour. Harvest. What about it? Are they harvesting at three and a half, half mile an hour? Do you remember what fast they're harvesting? Yeah. Well, like Repeat the question. Power. Yeah, the uh, how fast are they harvesting? Is that the question? Moisture. Yeah, moisture is similar similar to ours. Harvesting is very similar to ours also. They have a lot of big combines over there, and uh, basically they push the machines like we do, push them as fast as they go. So three, four miles per hour. Them higher yields, obviously, you got to go slower if it starts coming out the back of the combine. So uh, Kloss, I guess, was about the only combine we saw over there. And the one organic farm we went to was, what, a 3,000 hectare organic farm? They had three, three big cloth machines in there, and that's what they were running. Rob? Right. Was the key to that late season nitrogen the fact that they could spread uh, urea at 120 or 150 feet? Or when they were using liquid, how did they manage to burn? Or how did that, how did that late season nitrogen application work? How did the late season nitrogen application work? Well, they're using dry, they're not using liquid, and they're trying to bump protein in their wheat. They get paid a premium based on the protein at harvest time. So more than one guy told us over there that, that it didn't really prove to be more yield with that late nitrogen application of dry. Now you gotta remember, you spread it out there, you gotta, still gotta get moisture to get it moved down in the root zone too. So they're probably applying it a little bit quicker than maybe you would liquid. but. Uh, they're trying to bump protein with that late application, you know, when the plant is uh, the flag leaf or even maybe a little bit later than that. This is totally changing gears, but supposedly we've got a terrible surplus of wheat in the world. <laughs> what are we trying to do here? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know what the devil does to think about this. So the question is, is since we have so much wheat, why do we want to produce more? Well, I know Peter wants to answer it bad. He's jumping up and down. He's jumping up and down. But let me, let me answer it first. Is it's all about you, and it's all about you, and it's all about you to be profitable on your farm. But the dairy guys have done that, and they kill them themselves. And, and we're doing the same thing. We're producing more crop, and, but it's, it's all about each individual farming entity. In my consulting business, like I said, I don't sell anything. I work for the farmer. I work for you to make you more profitable. Now, maybe that more profit is not bigger yield, but it's to reduce your cost also. So good question. Peter, you want to tackle that one too? Oh, yeah, I love that question. <laughs> it, it's, it's 
great question. If, if you guys, if the whole of Michigan would just get over it and quit putting any nitrogen on your wheat so that we all, you all got 60 bushels, Ontario would love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, you can go home now. <laughs> Okay, we got to get wrapped up here. Okay, um, you want to wrap it up with yields? Yeah. Okay, so we need to get kind of wrapped up here. Um, it's good to have the questions as we went along. Uh, we, we were going to try to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. So kind of where are we going with this stuff? We, the three of us went on this trip. Uh, we, we learned quite a lot about how they grow wheat and manage wheat in Germany, and I think there's some things that we can pick up and, and use here uh, back home. And so, uh, as a result of that, we're going to have some research that's going to be started or is actually already ongoing. We, we are looking at seed singulation. We're looking at a precision wheat planter. Um, like I mentioned, we kind of created or, or kind of built or custom built a monosome row unit planter um, that I'm using to plant uh, wheat. And I got plots planted this last fall with it. Uh, I've got four different row spacings. Uh, from 5 inch up to 15 inch and I've got four populations from 750,000 seeds per acre up to 2.4 million seeds per acre. Um, the singulation accuracy is you got to plant really slow in order to get the accuracy so we've got to do something to the, the planter to, to make it work better. Maybe this horse drill that we're supposed to get this uh, summer um, that we'll be able to plant with this fall. Maybe we'll find out that that's a much more accurate system uh, to use but we're going to continue to do some testing in that area. Um, but I think, you know, the, the best thing I, that I think we've, I found about that planter, that monosome <coughs> unit that I planted with, is the accuracy of the placement. It is, you, you can get your seed much more uniformly placed in, in terms of depth, and the, the, the pinch wheels on the back, the closing wheels, do a much better job of packing the soil around that seed uh, than what a conventional drill does. Because you think about, like, you know, the, we've got a Great Plains drill at home. Well, it's got that rolling packer wheel on the back. That's like two foot behind the disc coulter. So if that thing hits a rock, it's going to pull it right up out of the ground. And where does that seed going to land when it comes down the drop tube? It's going to land on top of the ground. Um, whereas if it hits like a soft spot in the soil um, and it goes really deep, you know, I did some depth counts and, and I had uh, on that drill from half inch to three and a half inch deep wheat this last fall compared to the to the monosome row unit where um, it ranged from half inch to inch and a quarter deep. Um, and we had some variable seeding conditions. But So we're, we're going to continue to try to look at some of this technology and how do we manage the tillers, how do we you know hit these targets in terms of the yield components. Um, and I think that's where we need to start. It's not seeds per acre, it's not bushels per acre, it's the components that we need to be looking at. And so we're going to keep doing some work in this area. What would one of the monosome planters cost? Uh, good question. I think the the unit that I have was about six thousand dollars a row unit. So uh, cheap. Yeah, yeah, cheap. Yeah. I'm sorry. The wheat commission is not paying for that. Are yeah, the wheat. No, the wheat commission will pay for that. But uh, uh, so. You know, part of the reasons for doing some of the research is to identify what populations can we get down to, uh, and and you know what's the best way to manage it, and does it pay? Is it economically feasible to invest in that technology? I think where we might find the best middle of the road is where we can use a soybean planter um, to plant our wheat as well. And so we, we're probably going to have to look at a little bit wider row spacing, and we've got to figure out what's the right population uh, to do that. Okay, back here and then over there. How do you get our manufacturers to change their thinking? A basic grain drill is the same as it was 150 years ago. Yeah, the question was how do we get our manufacturers to change their thinking? Um, because the basic grain drill is the same as it was 100 years ago. Uh, we, we, we may have to look up elsewhere. That's why um, Jeff put this trip together to look at the Amazon technology and the horse technology. And, and we may have to start bringing some of that stuff in here. I met with uh, John Deere uh, about a year and a half ago to talk about that and they basically just, just laughed at me. It's too small of a market to, uh, to, to change their drill design to get to simulator or to get, get a better, even a metering system uh, on a drill or, or, or calibrating a drill. Have you ever calibrated a John Deere no-till drill? It's, it takes forever. This Amazon drill that I have, I can calibrate the entire drill in less than two minutes. And it is, 
it is the most accurate drill I've ever had. So if you change a seed variety, in two minutes I can recalibrate it and be exactly what I want to put on the field, or set it at exactly what I want to put it on the field. So if it's easy, you want to do it. If it's tough, you know, nobody calibrates a John Deere drill because it's too tough. So it's, it's technology, but no, John Deere says that they're, they're really not going to change. Do you rent that out? Do I rent the drill out? Yeah. Give me your number. Okay. Uh, Gordon had a question. I see you got plant growth right here. I think I heard you say that you use them somewhat in the fall. Just wondering what the front is. PGRs. Yeah, the question was about PGRs, your plant growth regulators, and putting them in the fall, and what are we trying to accomplish? Um, what they're trying to accomplish is they're trying to control tillering to some degree. You know, they will put palisade on uh, for, you know, to shorten the inner nodes and strengthen the stem to reduce lodging potential. Because if, if you got those plants out there that are, you know, holding up. 240. Yeah, 240. Bushel wheat. Yeah, uh, it's got, it's got to be strong. Um, and, and you can't have it go down with a wind um, where you can't get at it. So they're looking at the plant growth regulators that they use perform different functions and they're using it to try to like uh, Mike mentioned um, the, the, the tiller dominance of that first tiller they're, they're trying to reduce that or suppress that to let these other tillers come up you know the picture that, that uh, Mike showed of the crop canopy and how uniform the height was we have tillers little dinky spindly heads that are halfway down the canopy that we got to drop that head to go down there and get if we want to try to harvest those they don't have that they've got full heads that are you know, within say a foot of from top to bottom on that canopy. Um, Are they using Palisade for that? Or something? Uh, the Palisade, Ethafor, and CCC. Uh, I think CCC and Ethafor are not licensed in the U.S. for wheat, just Palisade. Okay, we need to wrap up here. Um, so thank you guys. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for putting this trip together. And uh, if you have any other questions, see us afterwards.